Uh, so, uh, Kanakia, um, if you'd like to say that um, as, as I go through it yourself, then you're mo most welcome. Tawa mai i runga, te tawa mai i raro. Tawa mai i roto, te tawa mai i waho. Kia tau ai te Māori pū. Te Māori ora ki te katoa, haumi e, hui e, pai ki e. Um, just for... Um, uh, since it's being recorded um, and not sure how many people will end up coming on, but if you could leave your microphones on mute um, for the session. Um, questions? Uh, we haven't got a lot of people on today, so um, just unmute and ask the question if something comes up. I think we can um, handle that today. Um, but you can also, of course, pop it in the chat and um, and I'll, I'll try and pick that up as we go through. Um, just a wee plug there um, for checking that if you're not already on the EOTC coordinator database, which you might be because maybe that's how you knew about this. Um, but if you're not, um, or you're talking to your neighbouring school, just check that um, the EOTC coordinator in the school is um, on the database. Uh, that is the place where you we're going to get the most direct input into schools on any updates in the EOTC. Um, and that includes um, the professional development that EON has um, on offer um, to support um, your staff in their practice. Uh, welcome to the, um, the last couple of people that have come on. Okay. Um, so just key messages around um, emergency response. Um, there's a few of them there. Um, we'll just read through them quickly, and then uh, what I'm going to do is actually just speak to each one of them. Uh, and and I think as we go through that, if folks have um, a question, just unmute and and um, interrupt and and just ask that, which would be um, which would be fine. Um, I just see I've got one one um, question, so I'll just check what that is. Okay. All right, let's go. Um, so um, the first thing is to have a set of emergency response plans that cover a range of different types of emergency situations that might arise in the OTC. Um, we'll talk about that a bit more. It's a different approach to going back a good um, five or 10 years in terms of how emergency response was handled, um, you know, uh, back then. The emergency response plan complement your RAS, that's your risk assessment and supervision form, or your standard operating procedure uh, for the activity. Um, and plan your event with handling an emergency in mind. Um, so, yeah, we're going right through that and think about emergency scenarios uh, when you're actually doing your planning to make sure that um, you've got everything covered, including the response. Uh, this includes when working with a provider, and we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, all emergency response plans have five or so uh, common steps to follow, um, so that you have kind of a step-by-step -step process that uh, people can get used to and apply when you've got a highly emotive um, situation, uh, when a, an emergency situation um, or emergency um, is unfolding. Take your emergency re response plans. Um, being able to respond quickly and effectively is important. A pre-event briefing should establish who will do what in an emergency. Um, not a lot of point in uh, not knowing what that is, having something happen and then no one really knowing who's the leader, who's going to do what. It's a really good thing to do in your pre-event um, briefing of your staff or your team that's going with you. Um, have the emergency response plan accessible for reference on the event. Uh, we'll talk more about that as to how that might work and what some of the limitations are. And then managing communication well is as important as actions taken to respond. And when we reflect on some of the um, the situations that have occurred for different schools over the last three or four years, um, handling that communication is absolutely critical and having staff in the field understanding uh, who talks to who and who you don't talk to. So we'll move on. Move on. Um, so having a set of emergency response plans. Um, so I'm just going to refer to uh, 
Um, hopefully this will work. Um, I'm hoping that you have um, a copy of the OGC Emergency Response Guide on your um, screen. Uh, someone pipe up if that's not the case. And I hope that it will scroll through. This is this is in the um, on our website in the uh, EOTC management um, safety management plan and toolkit template uh, that was updated and now put on the website um, about October last year. It's the most up to date. Uh, some of you may have seen it. Um, some of you um, uh, may not, but that's the most up to date one. Quick look through this particular guide starts with front page with all your important contacts on the front so that that's readily available uh, to folks who take this emergency response guide into the field with them and then we have um, a series of different types of emergency um, and a step-by-step -step process um, to work through to to manage that I'm just going to scroll through so you can get a sense of what's in there. Apologies if folks are already familiar with this. Um, and you can see that some of these step one, step two, they're not identical, but they're similar all the way through. I think this is the last one. That's the, um, the up-to-date uh, resource that you can use as a template. Um, it has, um, it's been um, expanded on from the 2018 version to actually take each of the different emergencies and go through that step-by-step -step process. It's a bit more robust than the, the previous template that was available. Oops, sorry. Um, regarding planning, um, when we um, are doing our planning for our EOTC um, event, um, you, you do your risk assessment, but then part of that process, you also need to be thinking, what are some of the particular types of emergencies that could result from the type of activity you're doing? and whether or not there are some things that you might need to um, add into your thinking from an emergency, emergency perspective. So perhaps an example of that is if you were doing outdoor cooking um, with a group uh, and you think, oh, burns might not be a good idea, um, then uh, you know having a, a source of cold water nearby uh, would be one of the things that, that you would have in place. So they don't prevent the harm but they certainly will prevent further harm if that those burns are not are not treated. So thinking about some of those things, uh, in addition to uh, applying these emergency response plans to uh, each event. Um, so in previous times, the emergency response planning would be on the old RAMS or safety action plan formats. Um, for a while now, they've been um, set up to be a complementary um, document to your risk assessment. Um, also, um, when you are doing your planning, are you using a provider and um, who does what? Uh, and this is really important to get clear. Um, often, if, for example, if you're going to a um, high ropes course and you've got instructors that are running the, uh, the session, then if uh, a child gets a finger caught or a burn or something like that, or um, swings and bangs their head or, or um, something like that, the instructor's probably likely to respond to that because they've kind of got lead responsibility for that. 
but your staff that are there as well will also be involved in that and being clear about what their role is. So they know, hey, the instructor's going to deal with the immediate first aid, and then I'm going to need to deal with telling, letting our te teacher in charge know if it's a multiple group, um, and then any communication with the school. And potentially, if that student needs to be taken to medical attention, that's something the school would do, not the provider. So being really clear about who does what and having that conversation with the provider. On the slide there, there's um, a few um, screenshots of some of the, the new planning templates, um, the risk assessment and supervision form, um, uh, the standard operating procedures, because uh, for different events, your school could be using either of those. Um, for example, the standard operating procedures for local activities, you might just have one of those uh, that you need, you want your staff to follow when they're taking their, your Akonga out into the uh, local community to learn. Um, and uh, so they follow that and they take the emergency response plans with them. So if a, a situation does occur, they follow that um, just the same as for any other EOTC. Um, briefing the team, I've alluded to this already, um, as um, just make sure that well, first of all, we're certainly promoting the good practice that there should always be a pre-event briefing before an EOTC um, event. Sometimes it's appropriate for that to be a five-minute get with the staff involved. Other times it's like a week before the event um, or even a couple of uh, pre-event uh, briefings just to get everybody clear on their roles and responsibilities. Part of that briefing should also be checking with your team that everybody's clear about what happens in an emergency and who does what. In those um, emergency response plans that I just flicked through reasonably quickly, it's a step-by-step -step process. And uh, the more that your staff can get uh, familiar with that, you kind of start with one, you stop, you assess the situation, you you keep you contain it. You keep yourself safe. You make sure that uh, the group is safe. And you know, and obviously, the first thing that needs to happen is someone is actually takes that leadership role. So we know we need to do that first. Then we we find out some information, respond to it, think about our communication, clarify our plan, those sorts of things. So making sure that um, we start to have a a common way in which we um, we think. Um, through our response to an emergency. Practice your response. Um, it's actually, it's, sorry, is there a question? Yeah, Jamie? Oh, yeah, sorry. Thanks, Gemma. I'm just going back to uh, a couple of previous slides around the SOPs versus the RAS. Um, I, did I hear you say that it was appropriate to have either or, or is it still a combination of um, this and that? Um, I'm thinking, like you said, about local trips. Yeah, and this, Jamie, this question has been coming across my desk quite a bit, mm. and it's, it's a, quite a tricky one, um, is that once you set it up, right, your staff follow the SOP, for stuff that they, lots of people in your school do regularly, and generally they're for the more low risk things. Um, but you have to do a risk assessment first for your local area before you write your SOP. Okay, so you do the risk assessment, and then from that, that identifies the controls you need to, need to have in place. And then when you put that into a standard operating procedure, it puts those controls into chronological order and then your staff will follow that. So Thank once you. you've done the planning, once you've set up the SOP, you can go back to say, this is the risk assessment it refers to, but your staff follow the SOP. Thank you, that was my understanding. Yeah, and so whether they are following a risk assessment because it's a one-off or there is no SOP for that, they would take the emergency re response plan with them if they're usually following the SOP, one of the things on there will be that they've got the emergency response plan with them. Yeah. 
and in theory then you could have as many SOPs as you wanted for a range of scenarios. One that I'm thinking of is uh, overnight accommodation in hotels, motels, hostel accommodation for sports teams, for example. Um, the variety is such, and often teachers won't have visited, but there's an opportunity to standardise a bunch of procedures around that. Um, those kind of processes of tucking students into bed for lack of a better term, mm. um, before checking out for the night um, themselves. Um, I, so think that's, a, I think that's, again, I think that's a really good situation to write to write a standard operating procedure for. Yeah, because um, you've got had, potentially multiple different uh, teams or um, cultural groups or whatever doing these things, and you want consistency across your staff around how those for safely managed overnight in some of those venues, yeah. Yeah, it's been um, well received uh, from our, our team. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I'll just click us back to the, where was I? Yeah, practicing your response. Um, the Health and Safety at Work um, actually says that your emergency responses uh, protocol should be practiced. Um, and we do that in schools. You know, you always think, yeah, we lockdown practice, fire drill, uh, those sorts of things. What we're suggesting in EOTC is that have a staff meeting or something and set up a couple of scenarios and actually ask all of your staff to go through um, managing an emergency, emergency situation. Um, or it can be more targeted around um, your staff who are regularly involved in EOTC, but there's a, a, an opportunity to together work through and practice the response so we've got a shared understanding and a greater confidence that you'll be going to be able to respond quickly and, and effectively. Um, having your emergency response plans with you, so some people um, say to me, oh, well, when something happens, you're not going to go running for your emergency response plan and say, okay, where do I start, you know, with bullet point number one? Um, no, you don't. That's why you've got to practice. You want to be able to have the confidence to respond pretty effectively. But then if you've got those emergency response plans with you, uh, A, you've got a bunch of contact details and numbers for man helping to manage your communication. But you can also go through and say, gosh, have I remembered everything? Um, and it can go back and you can just say, yep, yep, I've done these things. So to have that access there to give, uh, I suppose it's a little bit of a crutch um, that you want your staff to be able to respond to the emergency as it arises, but to have that resource there so that they can reference that and be confident that the response that they've made um, is a good one and is also uh, within the expectations of the school. Um, managing communication well is as, as important as the actions taken to respond. This is lots of debate about this often in professional development courses we run um, around uh, student access to cell phones uh, and the ability to manage uh, information in a timely way so that only accurate information goes out to the people that it should go out to. Um, so that you can contain and get the best outcome for those who are affected by the emergency and their whānau uh, and, the, and the school community as a whole, particularly if you end up with one of these um, serious harm or even fatality um, incidents. So um, being really clear about that and, um, and whether or not this um, new expectation of phones away for the day um, from this new government kind of helps us in EOTC to have, uh, be able to lock down those phones or not have them being used so that um, we can prevent little video clips or comments being made and sent out on social media. Um, oh, I know the parent of the student that's involved, I'll text them to tell them that, um, you know, their son or daughter's, you know, fallen off, um, something looks like they've broken their leg and, you know, you just can't afford to have that. 
So some of that's around uh, educating your students to say, this is what will happen in an emergency as well. So they understand if you're asking for a shutdown in cell phone communication. So they understand why you're doing that and are reinsured that at, at an appropriate time, uh, they're going to be able to communicate with who they need to because there's all sorts going on potentially in, the, in an emergency situation. Yeah, I sort of made a comment there, you know, once the genie is out of the bottle, there's no stuffing it back in. You know, once that misinformation gets out there potentially, it's so difficult to then bring things back so that you can have a very um, calm and measured and timely response to um, the emergency and have that communicated to the people that need to know. Um, I'll just go back up. Are there any questions? Um, are there any questions anybody would like to raise now or um, on what I've covered so far? Excellent. If you need, um, if you want to know more, uh, want some more support, ask some questions. Um, many of you, I think, will have been on to our EON's website and found different places. Um, we've got our National EOTC Coordinator Database. So, as I say, sign up um, if, if you haven't already or check if you're not sure if someone in your school has signed up. Uh, we've got our professional development page with um, of all of the um, offerings we have around both EOTC safety management and a whole bunch of our learning um, stuff as well. Um, and then there's the EOTC management tab, which has got um, the um, EOTC uh, management, um, safety management plan templates and all the toolkit forms that I've referred to that uh, where that emergency response guide template came from. So that's all sitting on, um, on our website. Um, and also you can, um, anybody can subscribe to our newsletter. So sometimes if uh, with the EOTC coordinator database, um, it only goes to, is set up to only go to one person in the school. So, but it's easy enough to sign up a number of people. So we don't have a, an unintentional gatekeeper of only one person. Um, so the more people that, you know, get access to the information, the more we're going to have people informed. Um, so that's a key area for, um, for support. I always do like a little bit of humor. I hope you enjoy that too. Actually, I look at that and I sometimes think, you know, what level of harm is acceptable? Um, broken bones, no. Nah. Um, so, yeah, any I just open up again for questions. Um, just on there, um, for any support that you would like, um, you can email us on that um, um, address. Uh, that will, will now um, um, come to me. Um, and um, I'll, I'll be coordinating.